Well, we're in the book of Philippians through our series, Always Rejoicing. And we're still in chapter 1. This is kind of the second part of last week's lesson. And last week we never got to the telescope. We had the telescope up here last week and we never referenced it. So some of you were wondering why the telescope was up here and it was never mentioned because we didn't get to that part of the lesson last week. So this morning the telescope is back and we'll get to it and we'll, uh, we'll understand how the telescope has significance to our lesson this morning. Philippians chapter 1. We'll kind of go through a brief review of what we covered last week just so it all kind of makes sense as we wrap up this uh, this portion of Philippians 1 this morning, but I would encourage you to go uh, to our YouTube channel or to Sermon Audio and listen to the entire lesson from last week to really pick up all of the themes that we mentioned uh, going through these verses. Uh, but this morning, uh, we'll go through and we'll read the entirety of our passage, verse 6 through 26, and, uh, and kind of get the, the context of what is happening uh, in this passage. Verse number 6 tells us, of Philippians chapter 1, Paul writes, "...being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you uh, in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God, but I would, ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. And that's our, that's our passage that we covered part of it last week. We'll wrap it up this morning. Uh, we talked last week about how uh, as believers, we should rise above mediocrity. mediocrity. He talks about uh, approving of the things that are excellent. Uh, we talked about uh, living an excellent life for Christ. We talked about following God's plans for our lives and that sometimes even though God's ways may not always seem uh, like it's the, the best way to us, he will always work things out for our good and for his glory because we talked about the fact that uh, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11, that we are created. God has created us for his glory and for his honor. And so as believers, uh, the Bible tells us, Paul wrote, that we're to, uh, whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should do all to the glory of God. Our lives have been created to bring glory back to God. So we talked about that in the first few verses last week. Uh, then we talked about 
verse 12 through verse 14 is really where we kind of spent the, the meat of our lesson last week uh, about the experiences that Paul went through. We talked about how he mentions that all of these things that happened unto me, they happened for the furtherance of the gospel. And we talked about what these things that happened unto me were. He just sums up all of the bad stuff that happened in his life, all of the trials, all of the, the negative things that Paul went through, all of the difficult circumstances. He just sums up in that sentence, these things that happened unto me, they happened to further the gospel of Christ. So Paul had a great view. This is we're talking about always rejoicing. When some people get uh, depressed and they get down in life because you begin to look at the circumstances and the negative things that are happening to you, uh, it, that's, that can happen to us. We can get depressed. But when we have what uh, is called the single mind, in the book of Philippians, Paul writes about this one thing I do in chapter 3. Paul was focused in his life, he was focused on one thing. His mind had a single focus, the furtherance of the gospel, making sure that as many people as possible he could get the gospel to while he was alive here on earth. And so even though Paul went through some of these bad experiences, he says, it's okay. I understand that this happened to me, but the gospel has spread more because of my circumstances. And we know that Paul was sitting in prison as he wrote this book. And we talked about how his troubles produced a bigger influence. You know, because he wanted to go to Rome as a preacher. Remember, that was always Paul's goal. He wanted to get there and, and, and to preach. But he ended up going as a prisoner instead. But we examined the fact that it's possible that his chains, those handcuffs that Paul was in, may have given him a bigger influence than if he had gone to Rome simply as a preacher. He had such influence with, that, with those Roman soldiers that he was chained to 24 hours a day, four-hour shifts, six guards a day, several thousand guards in this elite Roman group that probably never would have heard the message of Jesus Christ if Paul had gone as a preacher. But they were literally chained to Paul. They had nothing else they could do for four hours but to sit and listen to Paul pray and to read Scripture and to answer letters and to, and to see those people that would come and visit him. No doubt these soldiers heard the message of Jesus Christ. So his, his troubles, his negative things in his life gave him a bigger influence. We talked about how as believers so many times we want to enjoy the mountaintop experiences of life, right? We love the mountaintop experience. But we showed that video last week. We got it again there, Sean. Click that video, and we'll see. When we experience the mountaintop, yeah, it's fantastic to be on the mountaintop. But when we're on top of the mountain, this is Rocky Mountain National Park from last year, there's not much that grows on top of the mountain, is there? Growth doesn't happen. I mean, we're 14,000 feet up there. We passed the tree line. There's not a lot of growth happening there. Where does growth happen? Down in the valley. And so as believers, so many times we think, man, I want to stay on top of the mountain. But in Paul's life, you know where Paul experienced the most of his growth? It's through those valley experiences. Through the valley experiences. And so his, his trials not only uh, produced a, a bigger influence, but it gave him a broader impact. He says that his bonds were manifest in all the palaces and all the places. Not only was, was Paul going to get to... Uh, give the gospel to those Roman guards. But he was going to go to the palace and he was going to take the message of Jesus Christ into the palace as he gives a defense of the gospel. So he's got a broader impact. And then we talked about how his testimony produced a bolder inclination. We talked about uh, verse number 14 tells us that many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word. He's talking about the believers there in Rome. They were a little fearful in the beginning. But after they see what Paul's doing and what Paul's saying and how Paul is fearless and still proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ even though he's in prison, man, the, the Christians there in Rome, they kind of got bold. They saw Paul's zeal and they saw Paul's enthusiasm and they got excited and so they started going out and they started proclaiming the word of God more and more and more. We talked about the fact that our lives many times are the only Bible that some people will ever read. And Paul talks about this in his letters. He says that, that ye are our epistle written in our hearts. Some people, the only thing they will ever know about Jesus Christ, they're not going to pick up the Bible and read it. But they will watch your life. 
They'll, they'll watch you, especially when you go through those valley experiences, through those bad things that happen to you. You can rest assured that there are people who do not know Jesus Christ that are going to watch your life to see how you respond in that time. And so these Christians there in Rome, in everyday conversation, as they begin to hear more and more about Paul and they hear what Paul's doing inside of the prison, they know that his case is going to be coming up in the palace before long. These, these people in everyday conversation, their, their enthusiasm for the Lord just grows. And so they begin to bring up Jesus Christ to people in their everyday conversations with their coworkers with their neighbors, with their friends. In our lives, we've got a lot of people that we come into contact with. And our lives should be a representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ought to look for opportunities just in everyday conversation to speak a word for the Lord Jesus. And so this morning we get to verse number 15 where we left off last week. Whenever God is at work, And it was apparent that God was working right here, even though Paul's in prison. We see through verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, God is working. He's working in Paul's life through the prison to touch those prisoners, to to reach people that he probably never would have gotten the opportunity to reach. And God is working through the lives of those Roman believers as they go out and spread the gospel. Now, whenever God is at work and things seem to be going good, progress is happening... There always seems to be some who are going to try to take advantage of the situation for their own benefit. We'll read verse 15, 16, and 17 uh, this morning. He says, after all of these things, verse 12 through 14, he says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife. Verse 15. And some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Now, Paul uses an interesting word here in verse 16. He says, he uses this word contention. The one preach Christ of contention. Now, that word contention, uh, it means to canvas for office, to get people to support you. We, we're in a presidential election year, and we always hear about people who are in contention for the nomination, contention for the White House. They're canvassing. They're trying to get people to support them. Now, Paul's aim and Paul's goal in life, remember we just said what it was, Philippians 3.13, he says, this one thing I do. Paul has a single mind, a single focus, the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's concerned about getting people to Jesus, building uh, Jesus, magnifying Jesus, and to get people to follow Jesus. But Paul has some critics here. Their goal was to build a following for themselves. They were pointing people to them. Hey, look at me. And so Paul says, they're preaching Christ of contention, not sincerely. Instead of asking people, hey, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? You know, they're asking people, hey, whose side are you on? Ours or Paul's? They were more interested in that. And you know, it is possible to do the right thing for the wrong reason. They were preaching Christ, but for the wrong reason. Sometimes our heart isn't in sync with our hand. You remember in the book of Isaiah... What the prophet writes there, he says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is not by the precept of men. We can all say the right words, we can pray the right prayers, we can sing the right songs, we can give the right testimonies, We can can check off the right boxes on our offering envelope. We can check off the boxes on our Bible reading. And yet we can do it all with the wrong motivation. Paul reminds us in Ephesians. Look at this verse in Ephesians, chapter 6. Ephesians, uh, we got the verse? He says that we are servants of Christ. That we are to do the will of God from the heart. 
We're to do the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So why do we attend church? Why do we sing specials? Why do we sing in the choir? Why do we work in the bus ministry, in the children's ministry? Why do we work in the sound ministry? Why do we, why do we give? Why do we read our Bibles? We're supposed to do it from the heart as to the Lord. And you remember back in the Old Testament when Samuel went to find the next king? You remember what Samuel was impressed by as he goes to Jesse's house and he sees all of the young men? What was he impressed by? Man, these guys are they're, they're tall, they're strong, they're, they're, they're muscular, they, they, they're handsome. These guys look like leaders. But did God choose any of those men to be king? No. Who was it that he chose? He chose David. And he, he, he reminds us that the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. We, we see the outside. If we're singing, if we're doing, you know, if we have all of the right actions, we know the right things to say, we can fool some people. But then what does the rest of that verse say? It says, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God sees the real motivation for why we're doing things. When God observes ministry being done, he just as easily sees the motives behind that ministry. And then we go to verse number 18. Paul's kind of grieving over over their improper motive for preaching. But then we see his gratefulness for an impeccable message. What does he say in verse number 18? What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So while God can see the heart and God can see the motives, we can't. And Paul, Paul was fairly certain that there were some of these that were preaching for the wrong reason. But you know what? Paul says, I'm rejoicing anyway. Because even though they may be doing it for the wrong reasons, they're still preaching Jesus Christ. They're still preaching the gospel and people are still being saved. They're coming to Jesus Christ even though these men are doing it for the wrong reasons. These men are hoping to get at Paul. They see Paul in a weakened state. You know, he's in prison. He's not the the great man that he once was. But for Paul, there was no envy in his heart. Paul was not jealous of these men. All that mattered to Paul, again, was the preaching of the gospel of Christ. If you go back and read, there were two great English evangelists, John Wesley and George Whitfield. It's well documented that they had strong disagreements with each other over some doctrinal matters. Both of them were very successful evangelists, preaching massive crowds, and saw many people won to Christ through their ministries. One day, John Wesley was asked if he expected to see George Whitfield in heaven. And Wesley replied and said, No, sir, I do not. And sort of shocked, he says, So you don't think that that Mr. Whitfield is a converted man? And Wesley said, Of course he is a converted man. But I do not expect him to see in heaven because he will be so close to the throne of God and I so far away that I will not be able to see him. Even though these two men had some disagreements with one another, He still knew that he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and souls are being won. And he wasn't trying to oppose each other's ministry. You know, we don't have time in our life to try to figure out everyone's motives and everyone's reasons for why they're doing what they're doing, what their motive for ministry is. God has to sort through that. What we can put our confidence in is that God will use his word, to accomplish his message. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth and maketh it, for, uh, maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. When the word of God is given... God blesses the message of the gospel. 
We have an impeccable message. Don't, don't get so tangled up in your life trying to figure out somebody else's motives. Why did they do this? Why did they say that? You want to talk about losing your joy? When you start trying to, to get into people's minds and figure out what they're doing, start to have envy and jealousy, man, it'll eat your joy away. Paul shows us the example here. He knows these men, man, they, they may have some wrong motives for what they're doing. But there's no envy or jealousy in Paul's heart because Paul knows the most important thing. It's not him being greater than these guys or them being greater than him. You remember what it says in the Bible? Uh, John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. Spend your life making sure that Jesus is increasing. If you focus on him increasing and you decrease and you don't worry about what everybody else is doing, you'll find joy in life. And then we see here in verse number 19 through verse number 26 an assured expectation. Paul was good at keeping his eyes on the goal. Acts 20, 24. It says, but none of these things move me. Now we've talked about what these things are. Shipwrecks, beatings, stonings, all of these things in Paul's life. But what does he say? None of these things move me. Because Paul has a single mind, a single focus. Neither count I my life dear unto myself that, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He had his share of troubles. He had his share of disappointments. He had his share of trials and challenges. But Paul, he never lost sight of the finish line. For his own life... And he never lost sight of the finish line for the lives of those to whom he ministered. And so that's why Paul, in the book of Philippians, as we'll see here in a few weeks as we get to it in chapter 3, Paul writes, and he says, those things that were gained to me I counted for loss. I preached on this a few months ago. There were a lot of things in Paul's life that he could boast about, that he could brag about. He had a great education. Remember, he was a, he was a highly esteemed Pharisee. But he says, those things I counted loss. He says, I would rather win Christ than to have all of that stuff in my life. He says, I would rather know him and the power of his resurrection. And he says in verse 13, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. There's the single mind, his single focus. Forgetting the things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We saw in Acts chapter 20, 24, he says, I want to I stay the course, I want to finish the course, I want to run the race. And so that's why at the end of Paul's life, when we go to the book of 2 Timothy, we, Timothy and we read in verse number 6, Paul says, I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. The single mind, his single focus, the one thing that drove Paul every single day. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That's why Paul, that's why he could focus. He didn't care about any of the things, any of the challenges, any of the trials. His focus was on a higher plane. Several years ago, hours behind the runner in front of him, the last marathoner finally entered the Olympic Stadium. The drama of the day's events were practically over, though. Most of the spectators had left the stands and gone home. But this athlete, his story was still being played out. He limps into the arena... And the Tanzanian runner is grimacing with every single step that he took. He, he was bleeding. He'd been bandaged up from falling earlier in the marathon. His shirt is ripped. And as he limps into the arena, the few people that were left there, immediately it's, this catches their eye. And the crowd begins to cheer for this guy. Hours Again, he is hours behind the runner that was in front of him. 
The crowd begins to cheer for him as he gets up to the finish line and crosses it. He's interviewed at the, at the end there, and he's asked the question, why did you stay in the race? I mean, what made you endure? You have some injuries, you're obviously hurting, you're in pain. Why did you finish this race? And here's what he said. My country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish it. God didn't just save you so you could give the Christian life a try. So you could just kind of start it. No, God is not happy with Demas Christianity. There in the book of 2 Timothy, Paul goes on to say that Demas had forsaken him. The world allured Demas back. He gave the Christian life a try and says, man, this isn't for me. This is too difficult. I'm going back to the world. God didn't save us to do that. The Christian life, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. You're going to have some cuts and some bruises, some bandages. Paul did. But when Paul got to the end of his life, he still had joy. Even though he had hurt, even though he had pain, even though there were some bumps and some bruises, and it wasn't a smooth ride. Paul doesn't end his life bitter. He ends his life joyful because he kept his mind focused on one prize, on one thing. And we're reminded of the words that he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Nobody else may recognize what you do. They may not understand the things that you've gone through. But God's keeping record in heaven. And your service to God, it's not in vain. There's a crown. Paul says a crown was laid up for him. He knew that his service wasn't in vain. Other people may not recognize it. But God sees. And God desires that your life bring glory to Him. And by staying faithful, by being steadfast, by being unmovable, unshakable during those valley times of life when you're experiencing growth, may not always be the most fun time of your life, but if you'll stay the course, if you'll stay in the race, God will bless. We see here in verse number 19 that there's two strengthening resources that Paul has Look at what he says in verse number 19. He says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He's just finished talking about the criticism that he's receiving from some of these other believers. And criticism uh, is, is very hard to take in our lives. It's not easy to take criticism. Most of us don't enjoy criticism. Particularly when we're in difficult circumstances. I mean, Paul's in prison and he's being criticized. So how was Paul able to rejoice even in the face of these critics? Again, because he possessed that single mind. And because he expects his case to turn out victoriously, he says, to my salvation there in verse number 19, and because of the prayers of his friends and the supply of the Holy Spirit of God. If you could have two wishes for your Christian life, what would they be? You know, I don't think that we could do much better than what Paul lists here. Prayer and the Holy Spirit. These two, the prayer and the Holy Spirit, these two things work together in our lives to produce amazing results. The Bible says that the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I mean, imagine buying a brand new car, parking it in your garage, and throwing away the keys. But you know, that's very foolish. But as Christians, that's what we do when we get saved. We ask Christ into our hearts, and then we never pray. We miss out on the power that God has. He can accomplish great and mighty things. But without the Holy Spirit being accessed through prayer, we're going, we're going nowhere. And often we don't realize how valuable something is until it's gone. I was reading last week, Dr. John Getch has written a devotional, 365-day devotional on the, uh, 
subject of revival. And every single day's devotion has a snippet of some historical facet of great revivals that have taken place over the last few hundred years. And I read this story the other day about a man by the name of Daniel Nash. He became a prayer warrior for Charles Finney, one of the great revival preachers. And for two to three weeks before Finney would go to a city to preach, his friend Daniel Nash would go ahead of him and would be there to pray and to fast every single day before the, before the revivals would begin. He would rent a room and pray for three weeks for the revival. There were very few people who knew who Daniel Nash was, even knew his name. But Charles Finney wrote later in his life that when Daniel Nash died, the power in his revival meetings began to wane. Because he had somebody who was praying every single day for weeks before. He had a friend on his behalf that was praying and asking God to bless that preaching meeting. John Getch wrote and told the story about a lady in his church when he was a small boy that everybody called Grandma Tessman. And he said, every time I walked into church, she'd walk by, she'd pat me on the head and say, John, I'm praying for you. And he said, as a little kid, I didn't think anything of it and just kind of brushed it off. When I was a teenager, she'd come up to me and say, John, I'm praying for you. And he said, it always embarrassed me for her to come up and say that because I didn't really think I needed the prayers of some old lady. He said, then I went off to college. And he said, when I'd come back to visit, Grandma Tessman's words were the same when she would see me. John, I'm praying for you. He said, now, being in college and having needs of my own, I knew that I needed her prayers, and I was grateful for it. And after I, after I finished school and was called to preach, I would return to my home church on occasion and, and be asked to preach. And he said, each time after the service, the aged, elderly Mrs. Tessman would make her way down to the front. She'd shake my hand and say, John, I'm praying for you. And he said, now, as a grown man preaching, those words would bring tears to my eyes, knowing that every soul that was saved in one of my evangelistic meetings was a direct result of this lady's prayers. He said, one day, a few years later, my mother called me and told me that Grandma Tessman had passed away, gone home to be with the Lord. He said, I, I instantly felt empty inside. As I preached that night, he said, there just seemed to be something missing. He said, I knew what it was. I had lost an intercessor, a prayer warrior. You know, if someone tells you that they're praying for you, be grateful. And if someone asks you, you know, how they should pray for you, tell them to pray for God's power on your life. We all need God's power in our lives. You can't have anything better than the strengthening resources of the prayer of prayer and the Holy Spirit's power. Then verse number 20, we see two sobering responsibilities. Paul writes here, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. You know, it's our, it's our responsibility as believers to live in such a way that God would not be ashamed of our lives at any time. Jonathan Edwards, great preacher of centuries ago, he said this once. He said, live so that should you suddenly die, you would not be ashamed. If your life had suddenly ended in the past 24 hours, would you be ashamed of where you'd been, what you were doing, who you were with, what you were thinking? When we live obedient lives that are consecrated to God, we're focused on doing His will and bringing glory to Him, we don't ever have to worry about bringing shame to the name of Christ. And then our second responsibility, Paul writes here, is that God would be magnified in our bodies, whether through life or death. You know, where we go and what we do, it advertises who we are. God does not demand in our lives that we prove the gospel. He asks that we practice it. I like what one person said, it's good to be a Christian and know it. It's even better to be a good Christian and show it. So... Does Christ need to be magnified? I mean, how can we, 
as just mere human beings, how can we magnify the Son of God, Jesus Christ? Well, you know, stars are much bigger than this telescope. But they're really distant, aren't they? They're really far out there. But the telescope, when you look through this, you know what it does? It magnifies what is distant. It magnifies those stars, and it brings them much closer. Man, you can take this thing out at night. I mean, you can put it up at the moon, and man, I mean, you're right there on the surface of the moon. You can see everything on it. As believers, our bodies are to be telescopes that bring Jesus Christ close to people. You know, to the average person out there in the world, Jesus, this is some misty historical figure that lived centuries ago that we don't really know anything about. But as the unsaved people watch us, as we go through a crisis in life, as we go through some of those valley experiences, they can see Jesus magnified in our lives and brought much closer, just like this telescope does with a star. The telescope brings distant things closer. What does a microscope do? It makes tiny things big, right? To the unbeliever, Jesus doesn't look very big, does he? Jesus... I mean, he's just another man, right? Don Lemon, what did he say on TV the other night? Jesus Christ, when he lived here on earth, he wasn't perfect. That's what the average person in the world thinks, isn't it? He's just another person. Jesus isn't very big. Other people and other things are more important, but as again, as the unbeliever watches us go through a trial, through a crisis experience, the unsaved people, they ought to see how big Jesus Christ is in our lives when we go through it. The believer's body, that's us. We are to be a lens that makes little Christ look big. Paul wanted to reflect Jesus by living the way that Jesus lived. Paul wanted to reflect Jesus by doing what Jesus did, by saying what Jesus would say by reacting the way that Jesus reacted, by thinking the way that Jesus thought. Paul wanted to magnify Jesus Christ so that everybody else around him would see him. Those soldiers, men and women, boys and girls, Paul wanted to magnify Christ. He wanted Christ to be so great in his life that everybody that came in contact with him couldn't help but see the power of Jesus and how big he is. Paul wanted to be and was motivated by what motivated Jesus. Jesus said that he came to seek and save the lost. And man, Paul lived that out every single day. And then we come to the final five verses, verse 21 through verse number 26. Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Everybody lives for something or someone. Many people, if they were being honest, they would sum up their goals in life with a statement like this, for to me to live is pleasure. For me to live is wealth. For me to live is, is position or power or prestige. But Paul, what did he say? He said, for me to live is Christ. That was the thing that excited Paul. That was the thing that motivated Paul. It wasn't power or prestige or position or wealth or any of those things. The thing that got him excited. For him to live is Christ. You know, 
it's the thing that excites us that motivates us. There are certain stores that I can walk into, it doesn't excite me very much. Now, if I walk into an Apple store, my eyes light up. I get excited to walk into an Apple store. Now, you take me to a fabric store or to, you know, Hobby Lobby or something, I'm not very excited about that. But man, the Apple store, it makes me excited. That, that's the thing that motivates me in our lives. Does Christ motivate us the way that it motivated Paul? You know, it didn't seem like much was happening in the life and ministry of Jim Elliott. We talked about him several weeks ago, showed a little video clip there to the Aka Indians. There wasn't anything happening. He didn't win any of these people to Jesus Christ. They, he was faithful in his, in his ministry, but he's not reaching any of these people. But when Jim and Nate Saint, those men were martyred, you know what happened? Those Indians, they turned to Christ because they saw the Lord Jesus Christ magnified in the bodies and the lives of Jim and Nate and those men that were there. So are you okay? Either way, through life or death, as long as Christ is magnified. For Paul, it made his life worth living. All of us think we can accomplish a lot more through our lives than we can through our deaths. We can accomplish so much. But what about the life of Jesus? Was it not his death in which he accomplished his goal for being sent to earth? He is the model for the Christian life, right? But it was only by Jesus dying on the cross that we could have our sins forgiven and eternal life that was purchased because he lived a perfect life. And he died that substitutionary death for us on the cross. He took our place. God was magnified in the life of Jesus. And he should be magnified in our lives as well. Paul faces a difficult decision here. He says, man, to remain alive is necessary for you believers here in Philippi. But to depart and be with Christ, it's, it's far better. It's the thing I'm looking forward to most. And as he begins to think about these two things, maybe he pulls out letters from some of these believers at Philippi, and he begins to read name after name. He looks at his prayer list, and he sees name after name. And Paul realizes, you know what? Heaven's still there. Heaven's going to be waiting. God has a purpose for me here on earth. And he says in these verses, he says, you know what? I think Christ would have me remain for the furtherance and joy of your faith. Now, we talked last week back in verse 12, he talked about the furtherance of the gospel. We talked about how that was a military term meaning pioneer advance, opening territories into new places, progression, growth. Paul says, you know what? I need to hang around for a while longer because I want to see you believers in Philippi. I want to see you further, pioneer advance, grow, mature, take steps forward in your Christian faith and in your joy. And it'll bring joy to my life seeing that. The result of progress, when we pioneer advance in our lives, when we move forward, the result of spiritual progress is joy in our lives. That's what we're talking about through this series, joy. But in our Christian lives, if we're not progressing, if we're not pioneer advancing, if we're not going forward, and we start regressing and we start going backward, we lose joy. It's when we're going forward for Jesus, when we're growing, that we find joy in our lives. When we regress, we get depressed. This is what Warren Wiersbe said. When we regress, we get depressed. When we progress, we get blessed. I like how he said it. The third verse of the hymn that we sing sometimes, I think, puts it well. I will love thee in life. I will love thee in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath and say when the death dew lies cold on my brow, if ever I loved thee, my Jesus, tis now. Philippians 
becomes a valuable test for our lives. You fill in the blank. For to me, to live is, and to die is, for you to live, is it money? And to die is to leave it all behind? For you to live is fame, and to die is to be forgotten? Or to live is power, and die to lose it all? If we want to find joy in our lives, if we, want to, if we want to have the single mind like Paul has, if we want to experience joy, if we want to pioneer advance, if we want to, if we want to have spiritual growth, we have to echo Paul's convictions for to me to live as Christ. That should be the thing that excites us and that motivates us every day that how can I magnify, how can I be a telescope today? to magnify Jesus Christ, to bring him closer to those that are around me. How can I magnify Christ? For me to live is Christ. That's exciting. That motivates me. But to die is to gain because Paul says he had a desire to depart. Departing isn't scary, is it? I'm going to depart and go on a trip. There was nothing terrifying, fearful about departing this life for the next life for Paul because he knew what was waiting for him there. Depart, we don't have time to get into it, but there's several different meanings to the word. But simply think of it like taking down a tent, packing it up, and moving on. And Paul says, man, this tent, this body that I'm living in, It's ready to pack up and it's ready to move on because I know what is waiting for me in heaven. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That should be our goal in life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this passage from the book of Philippians this morning from the words of Paul. Lord, I pray that this week that we would think about those words, to live is Christ and to die is gain, that we would allow that to be our motto, Lord, that we would allow our bodies to magnify you, that we would bring you closer to those around us who may not know you, that we would uh, evidence your power in our lives so much that we can't help but have those around us know how powerful you are in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to use the resources of prayer and the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would not have envy and jealousy of those around us, that we wouldn't spend time worrying about the motives of other people, that we would focus our lives on that single purpose of furthering the gospel of Christ. We pray now this morning that you prepare our hearts for worship. Meet with us in this morning's service. Bless us as we sing, Lord. Help us to praise you from our hearts. God, we give you the glory, the honor for all that happens. Help our our minds be ready to receive the preaching of the word of God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.